Good evening aspirants. I welcome you all to the Hindu Daily News Analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the newspaper dated 3rd of June 2023. Displayed here are the list of articles that we will take up for discussion today. Please go through it. Now we will start with the first article discussion. Look at this article from the editorial page. This article speaks about India's concern over carbon border adjustment mechanism. This is the key climate law of the European Union. See, India is fearing that the carbon border adjustment mechanism will harm India's export of carbon intensive products to the European Union. So, India is now planning to challenge the carbon border adjustment mechanism at the World Trade Organization's dispute settlement body. So this is the background of the editorial in this discussion we will understand what is cbam that is carbon border adjustment mechanism and then we will see what are india's concern over cbam before that note the syllabus relevant to this discussion which is highlighted here now first let us understand about cbam to have a better understanding about CBAM of the European Union, we need to look at the European Union's previous climate policies. In 2005, the European Union adopted an important climate change policy known as the Emissions Trading System, which is also called by the names Cap and Trade or Allowance Trading Systems. The emissions trading system is a market-based mechanism that aims at reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So, how does emission trading system help in reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Now, I will explain to you this with an example. Basically, under the ETS, emission permits or allowance are sold or allocated to the entities that are included in the ETS. Let us assume that there are two steel producing companies named A and B which are located in any one of the countries of the European Union and both of the companies are included in the ETS. As we all know while producing steel greenhouse gas are emitted into the environment. So both A and B steel companies tend to emit greenhouse gases. Now coming back to the ETS. See under the ETS both the companies A and B will get some emission permits. This means that they are not allowed to emit greenhouse gases more than what is provided in the permits. So through this mechanism the European Union tries to cap the greenhouse gas emissions. But what happens when any of the companies emit more than the permit? Here is where the carbon trade comes into picture. Let us say the company A emitted less than the given permit but company B exceeded the permit. Now under the ETS, company A will be able to sell the remaining permit to company B. By doing this, the European Union can still cap the greenhouse gas emission by allowing the companies to buy and sell emission permits among themselves. This is how ETS actually works. I hope you got it. The ETS is one of the landmark climate policies of the European Union for its domestic industries. But when it comes to import, the European Union feels that emissions embedded in the products that are imported from other countries may not be priced in a similar way like the ETS. This is due to a lack of stringent policies or due to less stringent policies in those countries from where EU imports goods. So the EU is worried that it will put the domestic industries at a disadvantageous position. See, due to carbon pricing within the European Union, the price of carbon intensive goods like steel and cement that are produced by the domestic industries tend to be costlier. But when the same is imported from countries where there is no carbon pricing, the product would be cheaper than the domestic one. As the people tend to buy cheaper ones, it would be a disadvantage for the European Union's domestic industries. So, in order to tackle this, the impacted industries in the European Union had been receiving free allowances so far under the ETS. But later on, the European Union realized the phenomena of carbon leakage. See, due to the application of ETS, the European firms operating in carbon intensive sectors might possibly shift to those countries that have less stringent GHG emission norms. 
and this leads to carbon leakage. So, the European Union's ultimate aim of reducing greenhouse gas emissions will go in vain. Therefore, to address this issue, the European Union brought out CBAM, that is Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. Under the CBAM, imports of certain carbon intensive products like cement, iron, steel, electricity, fertilizers, aluminium and hydrogen will have to bear the same economic cost borne by EU producers under the ETS. So, if any of the European Union importers import carbon intensive products from the countries where there is no carbon pricing, then the importer needs to pay the price. Here, the price is linked to the weekly average of the emissions price under the ETS. However, where a carbon price has been explicitly paid for the imported products in their country of origin, a reduction can be claimed by the EU importer. So basically, the carbon border adjustment mechanism tries to address the issue of carbon leakage between the borders and that's why it got the name carbon border adjustment mechanism. Now, what is the concern of India over this CBAM? As we all know, India is one of the developing nations in the world. When it comes to carbon emission, India is not the significant player in the historical emissions. India says that the western countries are mostly responsible for the historical carbon emissions. Now coming to the carbon border adjustment mechanism. See, the carbon border adjustment mechanism of the European Union aims to impose a carbon price for imported carbon intensive goods like steel, cement etc. See, India's export won't affect that much. This is because the export of aluminium, iron and steel to the European Union only accounts for 1.8% of India's total exports. However, India has reportedly termed CBAM as being protectionist and discriminative. As we just saw now, the European Union is trying to impose a carbon price for imported goods wherever they come from. India says it is a kind of trade protectionist measure as the European Union tries to secure domestic industries at the cost of developing nations. India also termed CBAM as a discriminatory measure as the European Union doesn't take into account the historical carbon emissions. Now we will see what the WTO provision says. See, the ultimate principle of WTO law is non-discrimination. This means that the countries are required to accord equal treatment to like or same products irrespective of their country of origin. Apart from this, the countries are required to treat foreign made same products as they treat domestic ones. Basically, the WTO provisions ascertain that the countries should not discriminate between the same products whether they are produced domestically or imported from other countries. Now coming to CBAM. See, the author says that the CBAM violates the WTO law for discriminating between EU and foreign products. This is because under the CBAM, the European Union importers need to pay the price for carbon emissions that take place in the country of origin. This discourages the import of foreign products and accords protection to the domestic products. So, CBAM basically violates WTO law. However, even if the European Union's CBAM is discriminatory, there could be a chance for the EU to get CBAM justifiable. This is based on the General Exceptions Clause given in Article 20 of the General Agreements on Tariffs and Trade. See, if any of the measures fall under one of the listed policy grounds in Article 20 and if they satisfy the requirements of the introductory clause of this article, then such measure is permitted under WTO. Know that conservation of exhaustible natural resources is one of the listed policy grounds in this particular article. See, the CBAM would fall under this category. However, it is doubtful whether CBAM would satisfy the requirements of this article or not. Earlier, we all saw that India is now planning to challenge the CBAM at the World Trade Organization's dispute settlement body. 
so we have to wait and see what is going to happen to conclude india should work along with the european union to secure gains on cbam and to ensure a smooth platform for indian exporters to maximize the benefits so this is all that i wanted to discuss regarding this news article with the learned points in mind now we will move on to the next article discussion take a look at this editorial article this article talks about the recent unrest in manipur due to an order issued by the manipur high court first we will see what the issue is then we will see some of the suggestions given by the author to solve the issue before that the syllabus relevant to this discussion is highlighted here you can go through it now let's briefly see about the issue see as you all know there are 16 districts in manipur and the state is said to be divided into valley and hill districts the valley is dominated by the non tribal meite while the hill is dominated by the nagas and the kukichin tribes even though the valley accounts for about 10 percentage of manipur's landmass they have enough representation in the state legislative assembly nearly 40 out of the 60 members of the legislative assembly of the state belong to the meite community Manipuri which is the language of Meite is also recognized as the official language under schedule 8 of the constitution whereas even though the hills account for close to 90 percentage of the geographical area they have lower representation and their language is not properly recognized but the only advantage the hilly people bear is the status of scheduled tribe also the land of the indigenous tribal peoples in the hills of manipur is protected by the constitutional provisions under article 371c of the indian constitution so as per the existing law non tribals including the maitais cannot purchase land in the hills on the other hand the adequately represented maitais are demanding for the scheduled tribe status since 2012 in pursuit of this the meitei tribe union recently filed a petition before the manipur high court to extend the scheduled tribe status to the meitei community the petition argued that the meitei community was once recognized as a tribe before the merger of the princely state of manipur with the union of india in 1949 but later it lost its identity as a tribe after the merger so the petition further argued that the community has been victimized without any constitutional protection and they have been gradually marginalized in their own ancestral land the petition also states that their population has reduced from 59 percentage of the total population of manipur in 1951 to 44 percentage as per 2011 census data so the petitioners demanded to extend the scheduled tribe status to the community in order to preserve the community and save their ancestral land tradition culture and language in response to this the manipur high court on april 19 2023 asked the manipur government to submit a 10 year old recommendation to the union tribal affairs ministry this is for the inclusion of meitei community in the scheduled tribe list within 4 weeks in other words the court directed the government to consider the inclusion of the meitei community in the tribe list of manipur this is where the ethnic clashes ignited the demand for scheduled tribe status for the meitei community has been opposed by the other tribal groups of the state they believe that if the scheduled tribe status is granted meiteis will be allowed to acquire land in the hill which will ultimately result in loss of employment opportunities and would push the tribals out they even called for a tribal solidarity march which led to violent clashes on 19th april 2023 following this in a press statement issued on may 12 2023 kuki soul legislators of the manipur assembly called for a separate administration on the same day the valley based meitei committee urged for the protection of the state's territorial integrity 
here we could clearly see that the ethnic clashes have resulted in complete demographic and geographical separation the power to fulfill both the demands lies with the central government under article 3 of the indian constitution so the author here suggests three ways to solve the issue now we shall see them one by one see the first suggestion is to grant a separate administration in the hill areas of manipur for not only the kukki sos but also the nagas but the road blocks to this includes reluctance of some naga groups to compromise their vast territorial sovereignty and the firm opposition by the state and maithi groups so according to the author making this suggestion possible is bit difficult second suggestion is to grant a separate administration for the kukki zo in districts where they are dominant and resolve the nagas demand in due course see apart from the issue of hill versus valley there already exists a clash between naga and kukki zo over the land which dates back to the colonial times but if we try to fulfill their demands then the two cardinal principles of state recognition in india that is invoking administrative convenience and economic viability cannot be done so realizing this is also not a viable option third suggestion is to maintain the status quo ante where the territorial integrity of manipur is secured see here status quo ante means the state of affairs that existed previously this of course requires revisiting manipur's normative and political foundations in addition to amending the constitution according to the author this might help in a long run which could satisfy everyone's need individually and collectively so it is up to the government to choose and act wisely see all these suggestions are personal opinion of the author so just draw your opinion from it finally the author ends the article by saying that it is up to the government to protect the absolute anarchy of the majority or to promote and accommodate the rights of territorially mobilized minority group within and across the indian states So this is all that I wanted to discuss regarding this news article. Now we will take up the next article for our discussion. Take a look at this news article. I hope you all know about the train accident that happened yesterday in Odisha. The incident took place when a passenger train, the Coromandel Shalimar Express, derailed and hit a goods train and another train, the Ashwantpur Howrah Superfast, crashed into the derailed coaches. the number of dead is likely to rise and many are believed to be trapped in the wreckage the article says that nearly 240 personnel in nine teams are working at the train crash site in odisha's balasur district it is a very unfortunate thing to happen let us pray for the souls of those who lost their life to rest in peace we shall now see some important facts that has to be remembered about the national disaster response force See the National Disaster Response Force was constituted as per section 4445 of the Disaster Management Act 2005. It is a specialized force and its purpose is to provide special response to a threatening natural and man-made scenario or disaster. Originally in 2006 NDRF was constituted of 8 battalions. At present NDRF has a strength of 15 battalions with each battalion consisting of 1149 personnel of these three battalions are each from the BSF and CRPF and two each from CASF ITBP and SSB each battalion has 18 self contained specialist search and rescue teams of 45 personnel including engineers technicians electricians dog squad and medical or paramedics all 15 battalions have been equipped and trained to respond to natural as well as man made disasters battalions are also trained and equipped for a response during 
chemical, biological, radiological and even nuclear emergencies. Here in this image you can see 16 different locations in the country where these battalions are located. The locations are selected based on the vulnerability profile of the country and to cut down the response time for their deployment at the disaster sites. So now talking about the organizational setup, the apex body for disaster management in India is the National Disaster Management Authority. The chairman of NDMA is the Prime Minister. NDRF functions under NDMA. The head of the NDRF is designated as Director General. The Director General of NDRF are IPS officers of deputation from Indian police organizations. Director General is a three-star officer. So here are some of the objectives of NDRF. You can go through it. That's all regarding this discussion. Now we will move on to the next article discussion. Look at this article. The Congress spokesperson has raised questions about the working of the insolvency and the bankruptcy code. He alleged that IBC has been deviating from its objective of rescuing the stressed firms and it is becoming a way for crony capitalists to acquire companies at very low prices. He also makes a comparison between IBC and its predecessor that is Sikh Industrial Companies Act of 1985 and he also questions the efficiency of the insolvency and bankruptcy code. Now let us use this as a chance to discuss about the insolvency and bankruptcy code. See, the central government has introduced the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code in 2016. Insolvency is a condition where individuals or companies are not able to repay their debts. The main objective of IBC is to reduce the bad loans by facilitating the defaulter companies to restructure its management or by liquidating the assets of a company and distributing the money to the creditors. Creditor refers to the banks or institutions that have provided the loan to the company. See, IBC can deal with reorganization and insolvency of individuals. Not just individuals, it can also deal with partnership firms and corporates. Then, Debt Recovery Tribunal deals with the insolvency process of individuals, partnership firms, but it excludes the limited liability partnerships. The National Company Law Tribunal deals with the insolvency process of companies and other limited liability entities. The Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board of India will act as the regulator for overseeing the insolvency proceedings. Moving on, we will look about the insolvency process briefly. See, the current law sets a limit. The companies whose default payment is not exceeding rupees 1 crore will be covered under this act. Either the company or the creditors can apply for the process of corporate insolvency resolution process under section 6 of the IBC. The adjudicating authority has to be approached. Here, DRT and NCLT are the adjudicating authorities. Adjudicating authority can accept or reject the application for insolvency process within 14 days. If there has been any delay in this process, then a reason for the delay should be furnished. The moment at which the application is accepted by the adjudicating authorities, the resolution process begins and interim resolution professionals will be appointed to carry out the process. From the time of appointment, the assets and the management of company comes under the control of interim resolution professionals. Then a committee of creditor will be created. The committee of creditor will comprise of all the financial creditors of the company which is under the resolution process. It is the most important decision making body because it will only decide whether the company can be restructured or the company should be liquidated. The entire resolution process should be completed within 330 days as per the provision of this act. 
so this is all that i wanted to discuss regarding this news article now we will take up the next article for a discussion now look at this article from the sports page see india's top table tennis league named ultimate table tennis is scheduled to be held from july 13 to 30 2023 in pune the news article says that a sharath kamal who is an indian professional table tennis player is looking forward to participate in the ultimate table tennis the article further says that sharat kamal is going to participate in upcoming asian games and also in next year's paris olympics so this is about the news in this discussion we will learn some points about asian games and olympics now let's start with asian games see the asian games are the oldest and the most prestigious event held every 4 years it is the second largest multi sport event after the olympics athletes from all asian countries are welcomed to participate in this event the asian games is recognized by the international olympic committee note that the asian games were regulated by the asian games federation from 1951 to 1978 and since 1982 olympic council of asia regulates the asian games the symbol for the asian games is the rising sun with interlocking rings so far 46 nations have participated in the games and 44 sports have been included in the asian games history The Asian Games follow the sports program of the Olympics with athletics and swimming as core sports. Apart from this, the featuring sport disciplines which reflect the diverse sporting culture of Asian continent such as uh, South Asia's kabaddi and East Asia's wushu also take place in the Asian Games. The inaugural or the first edition of Asian Games was held in New Delhi in March 1951. Then in 1982 also the Asian Games were held in New Delhi. Note that India is one of the 7 countries to have participated in all the editions of the Asian Games. India along with Japan is the only country to have won at least one gold medal in every event of Asian Games. The last 18th edition of Asian Games was held in 2018 at Jakarta and Palembang which is located in Indonesia. The 19th edition of Asian Games is going to be held in Hangzhou, China in the upcoming September and October months. So this is all about the Asian Games. Now moving on to see about the Olympic Games. The Olympic Games is an international sports festival which is held once every 4 years in the olympics both summer games and winter games are held separately note that the international olympic committee is the supreme authority responsible for conducting olympic games the history of the olympics can be traced back to some 3000 years old where the games were held in olympia area of the ancient greece However, the first modern Olympics games was held in 1896 at Athens, Greece. Since 1994, the Summer and Winter Olympic Games have been held separately and have alternated every 2 years. The last 2020 Summer Olympics was held in Tokyo, Japan in the month of July and August 2021. The event was delayed due to COVID-19. and the last 2022 winter olympics was held from february 4 to february 20 in the year 2022 in beijing china note that the 2024 summer olympics is going to be held in paris in the months of july and august 2024 this is all that i wanted to discuss regarding this news article now we will move on to the next article discussion this editorial article is about generative artificial intelligence the article highlights the various concerns surrounding generative artificial intelligence and the steps that the government can take to address these concerns so in this discussion we will see all the points given in this article in detail now let us start with the basics see generative ai is a type of ai that can create new content such as text images or music It uses algorithms and models to generate new data based on patterns it has learned from existing data. 
to put it in simple words the generative artificial intelligence learns from existing data and then uses that data to generate new examples imagine you have a big collection of pictures of dogs generative ai would analyze these pictures and learn what a dog generally looks like such as shape color and textures it would identify common features that make a dog a dog once the ai has learned these patterns it can start generating new dog images it does this by combining different features it has learned from the existing pictures it might create a picture of a dog with the body of one dog the fur pattern of another dog and the eyes of yet another dog the ai is essentially creating something new that resembles a dog based on what it has learned the same process applies to other types of generative ai like music or text generation the ai analyzes existing examples and learns the patterns and structures that make them unique it then uses this knowledge to generate new music compositions or write new text passages that follow similar patterns so this is how a generative ai functions some examples of generative ai include chat gpt which can generate realistic and engaging chat conversations then we have dal e which can create high quality images from text descriptions moving forward let us see the potential functions of generative ai currently generative ai is mainly used to generate text images and code in response to users request but these are some of the simplistic functions that generative ai can perform the generative ai has some more potential applications for example in the medical field generative ai can be used to create realistic simulations of diseases which can help researchers to develop new treatments generative ai can also be used to design new molecules that have antibiotic properties this can be done by using ai to search through large libraries of chemical compounds and identify molecules that have the potential to kill bacteria in the gaming industry generative ai can be used to create new game content it can generate levels environment character and even entire game worlds providing endless possibilities for game developers the generative ai has a lot of applications in the world of finance generative ai can be used to identify fraudulent transactions such as credit card fraud and money laundering generative ai also can be used to access the risk of investments and other financial decisions so generative ai can also act as your personal fund manager that by it can optimize your investment portfolios and maximize the returns and minimize risk in manufacturing sector generative ai is used to design new products based on customer preferences and market requirements generative ai can also be used to optimize manufacturing processes and create alloys to reduce cost and improve efficiency so these are some of the potential applications of generative ai but generative ai also comes with its own fair share of issues the generative ai taking over the job of people is a major issue associated with generative ai however this is one of the least issues associated with it falsifying information use of copyrighted data and disregard for human dignity and privacy are some of the important concerns surrounding gai here falsification of information refers to the act of intentionally altering or manipulating data to present false or misleading information we know that generative ais learn pattern from existing data and generate new content based on those patterns if the training data used to teach the ai contains inaccurate or misleading information it can intentionally produce falsified outputs then generative ais can also be used to falsify data in a number of ways 
for example they can be used to create fake news articles fake social media profiles or even fake financial reports using generative ais government can create fake social media profiles that are designed to spread propaganda or to sow discord among the population also a hacker can create deep fakes that are designed to impersonate someone else and to commit fraud or identify theft so falsification of information aided by generative ai could wreak havoc on the society the next issue is the generative ai's total disregard for human dignity and privacy generative ais can be used to create deep fakes so deep fakes are videos or audio recordings that have been manipulated to make it appear as if someone is saying or doing something they never actually said or did As generative AI technology continues to develop, deep fakes are becoming more and more difficult to distinguish from real videos. This makes it easier for people to create and spread deep fakes that are intended to deceive or mislead others. This violates human dignity and privacy. The last major one is the issue of using copyrighted data. Generative AI can unintentionally use copyrighted data because it learns from existing data sets which may include copyrighted material. When generative AI is trained on copyrighted data, it may generate outputs that resemble or replicate the copyrighted content. However, it is important to note that Using copyrighted data without proper authorization or licensing can infringe upon the rights of the copyright holder. So these are some of the important issues associated with generative AI. So can these issues be addressed and what are the steps that government can take to address these issues? So this particular editorial offers some points here. Firstly, our government must maintain an open source AI risk profile. an open source ai risk profile is like a document that helps people understand and evaluate the risks and problems that could come with ai it discusses the possible downsides and difficulties that ai might bring and it is freely available for anyone to access and read so by openly sharing this information researchers policy makers and even the public can have a better understanding of the risk associated with ai and we can work towards developing strategies to mitigate or address these issues it encourages transparency and collaboration in addressing the challenges posed by ai technology secondly a government has to set up sandboxed R&D environment to test potentially high risk AI models here sandboxed R&D environments refers to controlled and isolated spaces where research and development activities can take place imagine a sandbox where children play in a similar way a sandboxed R&D environment provides a safe and separate area for researchers and developers to explore and innovate but without causing any harm to the main systems or infrastructure so this will help in testing the risk associated with ai models and optimize them in development stage itself thirdly a government can aid in the development of explainable ai explainable ai refers to artificial intelligence systems that can provide understandable explanations for their actions and decisions in simple words it means ai that can tell us why it did what it did for example imagine an ai system that approves or rejects loan application with explainable ai the system would not only provide a decision but also explain the factor that influenced that decision it might say the loan was approved because the applicant has a stable income a good credit score and a low debt to income ratio finally a government can develop a separate body to keep a watchful eye on the development of ai systems this will create necessary checks and balances in this new and emerging technology so this is all regarding this discussion now we will move on to the next article discussion see this news article revolves around the sedition act 
Recently, Law Commission released a report titled Usage of Law of Sedition. In this report, the Law Commission has suggested to increase the minimum sentence to seven years imprisonment from the already existing three years imprisonment sentence. The opposition parties have expressed their concern that the ruling party may use Sedition Act against the leaders of opposition party to suppress their voice. In this context, let us discuss some basic information about the Sedition Act. Firstly, we will look at the background of the Sedition Act. Sedition in simple term means acting against the government. Sedition law in India dates back to 1837. Macley in his draft Indian Penal Code mentioned about the punishments for acting against the government. Indian Penal Code came into existence on 1860, but this provision was somehow missed. Ten years later, that is on 1870, section 124A was added to the Penal Code. IPC section 124A deals with the sedition. Do you know who was the first person in India to be persecuted under the Sedition Act? Yes, it is Bal Gangadhar Tilak. Many famous freedom fighters like Gandhiji, Pandit Nehru, Maulana Abdul Kalam Asad were also booked under this act. Now, you may have a question, what does the word sedition implies? Section 124A defines sedition in the following manner. You can pass the video and take a look at it. Moving on, we will see about the punishment under this act. Sedition is a non-bailable offence. So, the punishment under this act ranges from 3 years imprisonment to a life sentence to which a fine may be added. This area is where the law commission has raised a concern. It feels that the punishment for section 124A is very odd. It has provisions for either a life imprisonment or a 3 years jail term, but nothing in between. The law commission opens that if the minimum punishment was 7 years, then the Supreme Court would have greater scope of awarding punishment in accordance with the intensity of the act committed. So that's all regarding this news article discussion. Now we will take up the next article for a discussion. Look at this news article. The Asia Video Industry Association, which represents many OTT players like Netflix, Amazon Prime, Disney Plus, Hotstar has been critic to the idea of auctioning the satellite frequency assignments. AVIA argues that satellite spectrum is a shared resource among different satellite operators. If this satellite spectrum is auctioned and the exclusive right has been handed to a single user, then it will limit the scope of reusing the satellite frequencies. AVIA has also requested the government to promote satellite internet connection across India. In this context, let us discuss about the satellite internet. See, normally the internet connection is provided by a fiber optic cable or through mobile towers. But how do we provide connectivity to a remote village, a dense forest or an island which is far away? That is where the satellite internet comes into picture. Let us now see how this satellite internet works. The internet service providers will send an internet signal to a satellite in space. This satellite then transmits the internet signal to the users. The internet signals from the satellite will be received using a satellite dish which is connected to a modem. Modem stands for modulator and demodulator which provides internet connectivity to your devices. So this process will keep on repeating. This is about the working of the satellite internet. Moving on, we will see about the significance of satellite internet. As we discussed earlier, the satellite internet can be used to provide internet connectivity to remote or inaccessible areas like a remote village, a dense forest or an island. In India, satellite internet connection is not widely used. It is mostly used in areas which lack terrestrial connectivity or with an undersea cable like Lakshadweep. This is one of the main uses of satellite internet. 
Now let us discuss about the issues in satellite internet. First is high latency. This is a major issue of the satellite communication. Latency is basically the time taken for the data to be transmitted and received. Next issue is that severe weather conditions can sometimes affect the satellite internet. Then the satellite internet is expensive when compared to the traditional means of internet connectivity. So that is all that I wanted to discuss regarding this news article. With this we have come to the end of this discussion. Now we will take up the practice questions. Today we have five questions. Four will be discussed by me and one will be the quiz question for the day. Question number one. Consider the following statements. Statement number one. The nodal ministry in the central government for the management of natural disasters is the Ministry of Home Affairs. Statement number two. The chairman of National Disaster Response Force is Home Minister. Which of the statements given above is or are correct? See here answer is option A. Statement number 1 is correct. The nodal ministry in the central government for management of natural disasters is the ministry of home affairs. Here statement number 2 is incorrect. The chairman of NDRF is director general. Question number 2. Consider the following statements. Statement number 1. Bad loan refers to loan which has not been serviced for a certain period. Statement number 2. Insolvency and bankruptcy code can help in reducing the bad loans. Which of the following is correct in respect of the above statements? See, here statement 1 says, Bank loan refers to loan which has not been serviced for a certain period. The statement is correct. Here, the term service refers nothing but repayment of the loan. Statement number 2. In our discussion itself, we know that this statement is also correct. Even though both the statements are correct, the second statement does not explain the first statement properly. So the answer is option B. Both statements 1 and 2 are correct and statement 2 is not the correct explanation for statement 1. Question number 3. Consider the following statements regarding the satellite internet. Statement number 1. Satellite internet connection has a high latency. Statement number 2. The internet signal from the satellite is received using a satellite dish continuously. Here statement number 1 talks about satellite internet connections and the latency. From a discussion itself we know that this statement is correct. Here the second statement is also correct. The internet signals from the satellite is received using a satellite dish continuously. The complex process of signal being transmitted from the satellite to the receiver satellite dish and from the dish to the satellite continuously is the main reason behind the high latency in satellite internet. So the correct answer here is option A. Both statement 1 and 2 are correct and statement 2 is the correct explanation for statement 1. Question number 4. With reference to Sedition Act, consider the following statements. Statement number 1. Bal Gangadhar Tilak was the first person to be prosecuted under this act. Statement number 2. Sedition is a bailable offence. Statement number 3. Punishment under this act ranges from 7 years imprisonment to a life sentence. How many of the above statements are correct? Statement number 1. Bal Gangadhar Tilak was the first person to be prosecuted under this act. This statement is correct. Statement number 2. This statement is actually incorrect because sedition is a non-bailable offence. And the third statement is also wrong because the punishment ranges from 3 years to life imprisonment. The law commission has proposed to increase the punishment to 7 years but no decision has been taken in this regard yet. So the correct answer here is option A, only 1. Question number 5. See, this is the quiz question for the day. It is about Asian Games. From the discussion that we had today, you will be able to answer this question easily. So read the question carefully and post the correct answer in the comment box. Displayed here are the main questions for your practice. Interested aspirants can write the answer and post it in the comment box below. If you have found our video to be useful, hit the like button, share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel. Happy learning!